there. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, Linda. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Welcome. I love the intro. That's really like upbeat and great. <laughs> yeah, yep, it is. I, I I think I was inspired by like the silent movies. I think it kind of sounds sound like a tune they would play there. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. welcome, Christy, to uh, live chat. Thank you very much for having me. It, it's it's so nice to have you here. And I always start to ask the guests because most of them are into genealogy, and we always want to know. Where are you at and where did your ancestors come from? Okay, well, I now live in Köln. I can't say it in a local way, so that's my way of saying it. <laughs> they have a far more kind of regional accent, so I can't quite master that. But um, I live in Köln in Wiltshire, um, in the south of England. Um, I haven't always lived here. I moved here in 2011, having lived for a long time in Reading, born in Stourbridge, uh, which is in the Black Country in the West Midlands. And I lived for a lot of my childhood um, down on the South Coast, um, it's just outside of Bournemouth and Paul. So I'm quite a Southern girl. I'm not really a Northerner. Um, and I don't have many ancestors from up North either. My ancestry is actually quite plain and boring in many facets. I don't have any of my ancestry that came from overseas. As far back as I've gone, I don't even have Irish. So, <laughs> um, but, but for the most part, my um, my ancestry is from what is in England referred to as the West Country, which is Devon, Cornwall, um, you know, the far west um, side of our country. Um, and in fact, half of my ancestry is from Devon. My dad was born in Devon and everyone back on his side. So my entire paternal line is Devon as okay. far back as I can go. And they don't travel very much. So that's quite nice and easy, too. <laughs> So that's nice. Well, I also have, um, every time I ask the previous the guest to ask a question for the next one. And since I had David Mittelman last time, and he is very much into DNA and forensic DNA, and he has a, a really great question. So I think we will start with that one because then we will, we will get to know a little more about you. So I will run the question and uh, you will have to think of an answer. Okay. I'm always curious. You know, I um, I got into this field because uh, from a young age, I was just very fascinated in, in, in DNA and, and what DNA could tell us about our personal stories, whether historical, medical or what or otherwise. And so so I guess I guess my question for the next speaker would be, um, you know, what what brought you into the world of genealogy or, or, or genetics or, or DNA testing? And, um, and and, and you know, how did how did you get into this into this field originally? So for me, I came in from the DNA side and eventually learned uh, an interest in genealogy, but I'd, I'd be curious how others jumped into the space. Wow, that's a good question. Well, um, in terms of me as a family historian, like my own research, um, I started probably a lot younger than most people, which is good because I had the opportunity to ask a lot of people a lot of questions before they weren't here anymore. So my mum's father, so my maternal grandfather, had actually done a lot of the research on his line before I was even thought of. Um, he passed to my mum uh, not only a family tree, but lots of documents that he'd collected. And I think he had been the sort of family archivist, if you call it back, that, that back in the 1970s. Um, he'd kind of got everything from the family, but also asked a lot of questions. And before him, his, let me get this right, it was his mother and her mother before, they were all interested in the family history. So I've actually got letters uh, from late 1800s of them asking each other questions, um, generations and generations back, which has been wonderful to unpick those now that we have a lot more resources. So I think I, I kind of always say that I actually have a genetic predisposition to being a genealogist. <laughs> Maybe I've got like a gene that makes me a genealogist. So I started really young, um, which as I mentioned was really good because I could ask a lot of questions. But unfortunately on my dad's side, his dad died when my father was only eight. So he knew very little about that side of the family. And my grandma did not want to talk. For, for whatever reason, I have no idea. On that side of the family, there were no secrets. There was nothing awful to uncover. Um, my grandfather was one of 16. <laughs> um, he, 
his father was actually a prison warder in a very remote prison on Dartmoor. So I always say, well, in the 1890s, they didn't have TV. They didn't really have cars. <laughs> so they didn't have much else to do apart from have kids. <laughs> so that, that was quite a lot of research to start off with because although my dad knew bits and pieces, he certainly didn't know all of the names of his aunts and uncles even on, on his dad's side. Oh, wow. We managed to piece it together in the end. Um, sometimes just going around random cemeteries and finding the family name and then realising they were actually part of my line. Um, but my grandma, I found out later down the track why she didn't want to talk about family history because her mum was born the wrong side of the blanket, as we say. Her grandparents weren't married. So okay. I think she probably didn't want anyone to know that. And I did find that out while she was still alive. There's no shame in it. Goodness gracious, we've all got illegitimacy in our family somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah. But she clearly did not want the family to know. So I didn't say anything out of respect to her while she was alive. But I've known for donkey's years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I suppose going back to kind of how I got into genealogy on a more kind of professional level. Um, I used to teach. I taught for 10 years. I've had quite a diverse career. Um, done all sorts of things, thought I'd be an accountant for a while and didn't really kind of fancy that too much. I've always been quite into maths and science, uh, not really history, but I've always been interested in genealogy. And I just decided um, in 2013 that I would give being a professional genealogist a go, because that's what you just decide to do and leave a teaching job that's well paid, <laughs> guaranteed salary. And let's just go and see if I can be a genealogist. Well, I'm here seven years later with a business on the high street. So I think I'm kind of doing all right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, I hope that's answered the question. <laughs> yes, it did. It definitely did. So, yeah, you, you went on and started your own business. I started my business this year now yeah. and then the corona got here. So, but uh, yeah. I still think it's the best thing I've ever done because uh, just to be able to work with what you really love to do is uh, it. it's uh, so nice yeah so what do you do in your business what do you do research or you do other things as well because I look a little at your homepage so please yeah. tell us about what you do um well I, I set up family wise actually in 2012 before I left teaching so I've been running the business for 18 months before I just threw the towel in on teaching um, and I've kind of been involved with doing some we call it air tracing or I do we have a television program called air hunters um, so tracing airs on estates when generally there's no will and I've been told by a friend of mine um, she said oh I've, I've started work for, for this air tracing firm and I started working for them she said they were really good and cut a very long story short they weren't <laughs> they're not one of the, the big names in the industry over here and it was somebody running her business from home. She worked during the day and expected her researchers to kind of run things for her. Well, the communication was just not great. And I thought to myself one day, I think I could do this and do it a lot better. So I decided that I would try and start looking at the air tracing cases by myself, you know, without the support of a firm behind me. And actually there were quite a lot that I could easily work out who the beneficiaries were. So I decided first of all to do that alongside teaching and then decided to, to set up in 2013 in the September, not the September of 2013 summer. Um, I thought, well, I'll just give it a go and see what happens. So I do a lot of air tracing. So we in England have something called the unclaimed estates list, which is a central government list. So that's published every single day. And there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of names on that list. So you could have a new list that's published in the morning that has 34 new cases on it or none or 96, I think is the highest we've ever had since I've been doing the job. So you've got all of those new cases that could be worth £500 or who knows what north of £500. So a lot of the work we do is based on that unclaimed estates list or work that we do with solicitors where they've got an intestacy um, or even if they've got a will where they can't find the people that are in the wills so we work to basically trace anybody for any reason so it could be family history um, we do dabble in DNA I don't personally do DNA myself uh, it's not something I'm particularly skilled at I've got two people on my team that are very very good at that uh, we do adoption work um, trying to find people's birth parents 
um, and support them with all the counselling and stuff that they need for that. So a real wide, wide variety. The, I always say the only thing we don't do is debt collection. <laughs> so I don't do any of that. <laughs> I don't find people for debt purposes. <laughs> Only for good reasons. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I like to use my skills for the good and not for the bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it kind of sounds like uh, we have a, a TV show here in Sweden called Arving Eus, and it's, it's kind of you don't know um, people that have died and they don't know the heroes or the, the people that that could get That's money. Exactly so it. yeah, yeah exactly. so yeah. so they try to to find relatives and uh, often these people have been living perhaps very alone or or and the people that they find they usually don't even know that they have a relative or or they the relative no. perhaps just stop writing or stop exactly. keeping in touch because they died and and then they're just put in a file and and after i guess a couple of years the money will go to to the state fund. yeah yeah. Yeah. Well, we um, we've got quite an interesting one, actually, that's come direct to us. Um, it's actually a friend of mine who lives locally and she rang me on Sunday and she said, I've got I've got a friend of a friend. So yeah, a friend of hers, who was trying to sort this chap's estate out. Um, but he was put into a Bernardo's home. So he was like, I don't think he was necessarily orphaned, but he certainly didn't grow up with his parents at all. So um which she knew nothing she knew that he'd been married twice but had no children so no immediate family so she said oh can you have a look and see if you can find the extended family oh my life there are literally dozens of cousins dozens and dozens of cousins the case file that we've created today is huge and it's like this poor guy had no idea that he had these relations and they won't know that he existed yeah. So, so we've written out some letters today and we've put them into a GEDCOM just to explain, you know, well, this is your dad and this is his dad and this is this person to try to explain all the connections. Because otherwise people think, well, I don't know who it is. Yeah. So it will be lovely to find them, but also quite sad that he didn't know they existed and then they wouldn't have known him. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of the case that they bring up in the show also. It's, uh, it's uh, often very sad cases but, mm -hmm, uh, yeah but uh, they kind of end happy in some way yeah so they they, yeah, they get to see a photo of this relative they didn't know they had and, and that's stuff what like we that, so. we battle so hard to get photographs linda you wouldn't believe the lengths we go to sometimes yeah. <laughs> you know, do you have a next door neighbor that you knew a long time do you have a photograph of them yeah <laughs> you know we'll go to a care home or something and say do you have any photographs <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes they do and a lot of the time unfortunately they don't yeah yeah that that I, I that must feel like a really really nice job to do it and uh, and help people and uh yeah absolutely we had some interviews actually yesterday because we needed some more support on our admin team our administration side um and we were sort of talking to the three candidates and they said God, your job sounds absolutely fascinating. Like we always say at the end, are you still interested in the job, of course? Um, and all three of them said, oh my gosh, I really desperately want the job. You know, I want it even more than I wanted it before. <laughs> because if you think about a, a normal admin job, you know, you might go into an office and do the same old stuff day after day after day, but not in my office. <laughs> yeah, it, it's Never. really, really, really rewarding. Absolutely. And it's yeah. really like you never know what's going to come in. You never know who's going to be on the phone. You never know how things are going to progress in the day. So it's just a wonderful job to have. I'm so lucky. Yeah, sounds <laughs> great. But uh, you do a lot of other stuff as well because I, yeah, you have just, just your old few bits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just your few bits. No, never like yeah. to be sat still for too long. <laughs> Yeah, I've written I've written one book. I actually, when I left my teaching job, I when you're in teaching, you always leave a class halfway through an exam set. So like if you've got a GCSE group, um, year 10 and year 11 are our GCSE school years. And I had a lovely year 10 set, top set that I had to leave halfway through when I left uh, my last job. And I said to them, I'm leaving to write my second book. Oops. 
<laughs> I did quite a bit of work on it, but it's never quite come to being finalised and written and published. But that was why I was leaving to kind of do that and do more research. But it didn't really happen because I just got busy doing other things. Yeah. So so no, but I've been involved in loads of sort of society stuff. Um, I've set up two societies from scratch. Um, the Surname Society and the Society for One Place Studies. Um, so which one was first? I'm trying to remember now. Society for One Place was the first one. And we started off that with four of us in England, one in America and one in New Zealand and had like loads of meetings online and you, all the committee meetings were online. Everything we do is online. And then the Surname Society kind of followed suit, really, when I sort of thought, I think there's a bit of a gap for an online surname society because although I'd been involved with the guild of one name studies before a lot of their stuff was UK based so people although they were members from all over the world you couldn't really access everything like the AGM was in England so unless you flew to England you couldn't be at the AGM okay um I think they're doing more now like all of us are (laughs) So yeah, I set both of those up and then last year uh, set up the genealogy show. So we had the genealogy show at the NEC um, in Birmingham, which would have been this coming weekend for 2020. Well, I know, I was I couldn't <laughs> make it last year and I said, I will go next year. And I yep. was saying, I will come next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're, pl- we're full steam ahead for next year. So, I mean, it's, it, it's not quite as planned, obviously. We've got a few things planned for the weekend, actually. So keep an eye out on social media because we're not letting the weekend go without recognising that it would have been the show, even though it isn't. But, uh, but yeah, that was uh, my crazy idea from 2018. I thought, why not? Yeah, why not? Well, why not? Because it's darn hard work. <laughs> It is darn hard work, <laughs> but it was a really good success, and we're hoping to build on that um, in 2021. And hopefully, things will return to, as we all say in England, a new normal, whatever new normal means. Yeah, I don't know if you use. Do, do you have the same phrase in Sweden for? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, yeah, the new normal. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> because we but don't yeah. know. What, we don't know what normal will be Mm-mm. after yeah, this. No idea. What will, no. what will be normal? No, I know for every week changes even over here you know yeah. two weeks time maybe I can get my hair chopped so they tell me yeah so I might be able to see it properly <laughs> <laughs> oh, fingers crossed otherwise I might get snipped out <laughs> so I just want to say hi to the people who are watching as well we have Anna Karin from Växjö and we have Maria from Stockholm and we have Martina from Gothenburg and we have Ingrid. Hello. And if you have questions, please ask them in the comments and um, we will try to answer them. And we have an expert on, on uh, British genealogy here. So I can certainly are... try. If, if I yeah. don't know the answer, I can usually signpost you to somewhere that you can find it. <laughs> yeah, because because that, that is what you do also. You do a lot of British genealogy, of course, since you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the business is quite international. We've actually got um, a chap who's just moved over from Australia to work in the office. He came over because he wanted to do a little bit of work and a little bit of travel. OK. One bit of that worked. <laughs> the other yeah, bit, not quite work. so much. Yeah, the work, the work bit's working yeah. like a dream for me, but not quite sure the travel bit is working quite so well. Um, but yeah, so he's he's really adding some really good resources that I never knew um, into my armory for Australian and New Zealand research, which is fabulous. Um, we can pretty much research anywhere. I say that loosely. I mean, my Ethiopian and Sudanese research isn't fantastic, but you know, if it, within the kind of you know English speaking world, we can certainly do anywhere. Um, and I've met so many people over the years because I've been involved with the voluntary side. I've met so many people that actually, if I can't do it, I know somebody somewhere you know, who might live in Maryland or Michigan or Alabama or whatever, yeah. who I can kind of go either, can you help or can you advise or something like that? But yeah, I've, my British research is clearly the strongest, it's my strongest, uh, <laughs> strongest string in the bow. Um, so I've been researching, as I say, since I was seven, not actively when I was a child per se but when I moved to Reading which is where I studied a chemical physics degree because that's what you do when you're a genealogist Um, but the research side I like to think is what I was interested in 
But uh, I used to go up on the train up to London, which, of course, before the Internet, we had to go to London to the main archives to do the research. And I used to go up there on the train every Saturday, stand outside the Family Records Centre and pull the big books off the off the shelves. I kind of wish I hadn't bothered now because you can do it all on the computer. I would have saved hours and probably yeah. lots of money. <laughs> but we didn't know the Internet was coming and that, you know, genealogy would be so popular and all over the Web. Um, so, yeah, I, I did that for a very, very long time. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like to say I earned my stripes because I, I sort of think that people have come into genealogy just doing it the easy way online. <laughs> really, it's not all online, is it, Linda? <laughs> no, it is not. There's so much that it's not online. Most yeah, of it isn't absolutely. online, really. All so, the good uh, stuff. Yeah, all yeah. the good stuff. Yeah. So, so no, I, I earned my stripes the hard way of slogging through the, the microfiche and microfilm and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I mean, Devon is my is my go-to county because that's where I know a heck of a lot about but most for most of the, the counties the research not what's actually been retained but the research is quite similar um, you know it's not too, not too different from county to county uh, very different if you go north of the border as I say up to Scotland completely different website won't share the data with anybody okay. <laughs> put it on Scotland's people that's it <laughs> so it's very different up there but England and Wales is is pretty much my my uh, area of expertise so ask away any questions you've got on England and Wales and even if it's Scotland I can probably manage to, to kind of give you a few pointers even if I don't know the answer up there too. <laughs> yeah I, I haven't had any I don't have any relatives that move to England or or to oh, wow. or that way so I haven't been looking so much into it but what are what are uh, what are the hard parts of doing genealogy? <laughs> yeah. The people okay. who disappear. The okay. people and who then, appear, it, who appear okay. from outer space and then just disappear again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the hardest thing, um, I don't think it's the hardest thing, but one of the hard things is that certainly in the 1900s, there's a lot of name changes when people arise, particularly if they have Jewish heritage. So we've we've got one particular tra air tracing case that there's one side of the family that every single different person on that same generation changes their surname to something completely different to one another. So they don't just, you know, on on block, just go, I'm going to change from being, you know, Mendelssohn to Martin. That's fine. I can cope with that because I can track all of you because your birth dates stay the same oh no 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 just change it to whatever you fancy <laughs> <laughs> i mean with the, the case um i'm just trying to think what the mother's name was um so the person who passed away was called sandra patricia austin um her dad was actually born as leon i think it's leon orenstein but because it was so jewish changed it yeah. to leo 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 austin or leon austin um, the mother married as Kitty Solomons, sounds still quite Jewish, Solomons is still quite Jewish, but she was born as Katie Vigdashik. Okay. So how do you get from <laughs> Katie Vigdashik to Kitty Solomons? Yeah. And then she ends up being Kitty Austin anyway, when she gets married. So about as not Jewish as you could sound, really. Um, so I think that's one of the hard things because people did, as I say, change their names to anglicise it a lot if they were from um, from Jewish stock. Um, and as I say, I think some people just they appear from somewhere. And, you know, if it says, oh, they were born in England. Well, great. It's a big old place, you know, <laughs> on a set on a census, you know, born England. Well, yeah, fantastic. Well, it's, a bit, it's a bit like the 1911 census saying born Sweden, isn't it, Linda? You know, yeah, great. I've got yeah. a country. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We actually had I remember one air tracing case where the place of birth was actually stated as Europe. <laughs> and I was just I, I'm not even looking at it. I am not even looking at it. <laughs> I just yeah, just move on by. There's plenty more cases where that can stay there. <laughs> but um but yeah, I mean I think before 1837, it's harder to research in England as well because it's not centralised. So okay. um, good old Queen Victoria, she didn't smile very much, but I do like her. Um, <laughs> she decided that she wanted to keep records of the people in her Commonwealth when she was crown queen. 
So mm -hmm. she was actually the one, maybe not personally, but she was the one that got civil registration of um, births, marriages and deaths all centralised. So it wasn't any more like a baptismal record somewhere in a church, God knows where. It was actually all centralised. And the same with the censuses every 10 years. Again, her idea to find out who lived in the Commonwealth. So, see, so yeah, I can see a question there. Have, have I researched any cases involving Sweden? Yeah, <laughs> that's the question up here. So, yeah, I, I haven't actually, because um, I know lots of great people that could if I needed to. <laughs> 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 no, I tend, I tend not to dabble in places that I don't know so well, especially with the language. Um, although I have, as I was saying to Linda before we went live, um, I do have a cousin, uh, actually two cousins, um, who live in Sweden. Um, and who I think are Swedish nationals. Um, certainly, their father was was Swedish, so probably either dual citizens or or Swedish nationals. Um, never even been to Sweden, which is quite embarrassing when I have family there. But um, but no, I tend to um, outsource work to experts in the areas because I think what's the point of me trying to do something that you can do way better because yeah. you're there, you're yeah. on the ground, and you know it. Yeah. So, so no, I do tend to um, do tend to outsource more, more than I try and stick my finger into too many different pies. <laughs> so yeah, I've got um, a friend who, who lives there, or a couple of friends actually who live in Norway who've done some work for me over in Norway because we have had some cases that have taken us over there. Yeah. So I might have a look at the unclaimed estates list, Linda, and see if there are any in Sweden and pop yeah. them over here. Yeah. <laughs> have a little look. <laughs> they might have been might have been mined many years ago. They might be absolutely horrendous, but we can have a look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because what, what kind of what kind of records do you you have the census? It, it's it's every tenth year, and then you have birth and marriage and death. And yeah. what other kind of records do you have? We have lots. I mean, I use main staple things find my past ancestry um and they have so many different things we have wills right the way up to anything that's currently been probated in england that you can it's one pound fifty which is nothing um they used to be ten pounds so i don't quite know how it's gone from ten to one pound fifty but i'm grateful yeah everything else goes the other way yeah <laughs> but um but no so you can get wills for one pound fifty which i find a fascinating um, in terms of the content but b they can really help our research because if I've lost somebody like I don't know who they married if they're a lady and I need their married name to to find them often if I get one of their parents wills it'll go oh and my daughter Janet Brown and you're like oh you married a brown yeah <laughs> or I might or I might know that she married a brown and I'll be grateful for an address yeah. <laughs> so yeah I do, do love a good will um what else would i say my go-to's um shipping records love a good shipping record um very very handy especially if they've got the um the date of birth on and the address of where they were going from or to um that's really handy um immigration records love love those kind of ellis island stuff and um going across there's a, a canadian kind of from from new york not not new york Anyway, one of the um, America to Canada sort of yeah, border yeah. crossings. Yeah, border crossings. Um, I find, find them absolutely fascinating. But I, I have to say my main kind of go-to is I just put someone's name, unless they're John Smith, in the front of a search. So I, would, I wouldn't I would go to find my past and like just go, oh, I want a birth. I just put it in the front. And then I think, okay, well, actually, I wasn't looking for that, but that looks quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. And if I get too much, then I'll just restrict, restrict my search. Um, but sometimes I find all sorts of fascinating stuff that I wouldn't have even bothered to try and look for because I didn't know it was there. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, so, yeah, that's that's a fun part when you when you find something and you, you didn't yeah. even realize it existed. Exactly, especially if someone disappears out of England, you know, where did they go to? And if you just put it in the front, then it will give you like hopefully a shipping record or you know that they died in New Zealand and there's a probate in New Zealand or something like that. So yeah, I'm a big front end of the search engine girl bung it in <laughs> see what happens <laughs> yeah i think yeah. those are my, my kind of favorite records but i do like a good military record as well yeah because they often give me a bunch of kids you know if it's a, a world war one they'll often give you a bunch of children and tell you who the wife was which if it's a common name is blooming priceless and they're all digitized on ancestry well not all the ones that survive <laughs> yeah because they didn't all survive nope. <laughs> sadly it's like everything isn't it it's always the one you yeah. really want that's not there. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a hard one. You never find so yeah. Yeah, and sometimes you, sometimes when I help someone and and I type in and they have like newspaper articles and military oh, records yeah. and everything, and I have to really really struggle with my own. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank Newspaper you. articles are great. It's funny yeah. you should mention that. Because yeah. um, my, uh, the chap I, well, my great grandfather, who was a prison warder, his wife's father was also a prison warder, same prison. And I think that's probably how, how my great grandparents met. Um, and unfortunately, the, um, the Dartmoor prison, the, the administration block, um, the, the, the building was actually burned down in 1937 in a, made a crazy riot in the prison. So a lot of the administration, like staff records, don't exist because they've been destroyed by the fire. So I was really disappointed because I thought, oh, you know, Samuel Silliphant is my great great granddad and Francis William Maunder, that's my great granddad, were both warders. And I thought, oh, it'd just be so nice to know more about, you know, were they good officers? But, you know, did they get pay rises? Were they naughty? You know, anything. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, I found a newspaper article. It was in the, um, the Nas is it National Library? It's the Welsh one, anyway, the Welsh newspaper archive. I forget what the proper title is, but it's through the National Library of Wales. Um, and they digitised a whole lot. And it's all free. Um, and I put Samuel Silliphant in. And up pops an article about when he um, stopped a prisoner from escaping. Wow. And it's, it's, in, it's in Wales in this newspaper article and it's yeah. it, i think it was either even in a cardiff newspaper which is wales yeah so but it wasn't in wales that it happened but obviously it was deemed important enough to be in the paper yeah so i wasn't really thinking i would find anything in wales but yeah just pop in his name and it's quite a rare name unless you collect all of them which i do um <laughs> but yeah so I, I just popped in silliphant and up he popped which is which is really weird so um See Anna's put which of the English censuses were destroyed? Um, I don't think there are any that were destroyed. Um, not that I'm aware of anyway. Um, I know that we didn't take one in 1941. It's because ours are all in the ones. So 1841, 1851, blah, 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 blah. Um, so we're expecting the 1921 to come out in a year's time. Um, but 1941 wasn't taken. Okay. for obvious reasons yeah. we had other, other things to do yeah <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't have electoral rolls or censuses or anything um but um i don't I don't believe there are any that are destroyed as far as i know anyways but uh, okay just perhaps, perhaps irish record census records oh I, irish yeah, yeah, there's, yeah there's a lot of irish stuff that um has been destroyed over the years although some of that is myth and legend i will say um there is a lot more irish uh research material available than people actually think um so I, I think a lot of it is people have always said oh all the irish records have been destroyed they haven't they really haven't it's just it is harder to find but there's stuff coming online i mean the northern ireland um what do you do uh but birth marriages and deaths you can now search online up to a point there's a cut off i forget 100 years 75 years yeah. something um and there's lots of really good um irish uh research coming up uh, research material coming online as well uh, civil is it civil registration no irish genealogy ie is really good for um for ireland mm. and it's free totally free um it's got images transcriptions all sorts um so that's really really good uh yeah there's there's a lot more than people think i think yeah. as i say it's it's everyone said oh it's really difficult but actually it's not that bad <laughs> But but did I hear you, you said that the 1920 census are coming out soon? Or do you have 1921. like 1921. So you have you have like uh, 100, 100 year. year yeah wow. yeah 100 year closure. We managed to get the 1911 out a couple of years early, um, but it was on the proviso that the um, the last column was redacted was was obscured. Okay. So uh, because that's the one where it says deaf dumb blind yeah, okay. whatever yeah. disabled yeah. so so we managed to get that out a bit early uh but 1921 not so much <laughs> okay but so, uh, yeah but how is it if if you trying to find uh, new records could you like contact the archive and they will look at it and see if if you can if you can yeah, get a copy there's, there's different closure for different uh records i mean i've i've tried to look at sort of workhouse records over the years and sort of hospital records and things like that and it depends on what's in the book. Yeah. So if the book starts in, say, 1902, 
but carries on until 1942. Well, the end of the book might fall in the closed section, yeah. but the beginning of the book might not. So it might be that you're literally kind of watched over by somebody so that you don't go past that page in the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or they just won't let you see it. Okay. They just yeah. won't they just won't let you see it at all. Um it very much depends from archive to archive, to be honest. Um I've had some really good ones that will literally put a slip of paper in and, and you just are kind of watched from a distance and they are trusting of you and kind of half look over but not really. Yeah. <laughs> But as I say, some that they won't at all and some that they'll look at the page for you and maybe photocopy it. But yeah. And yeah, it depends. Yeah, I think that's how if, if they are um, quite new records here in Sweden, then they, they take a photocopy of it and then they uh, paint over the stuff that you are yeah. not allowed to see. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it's I think for us, because some people do live past 100, yeah. you know, you don't want people necessarily knowing all of your data from a hundred years ago. If you're, you know, not necessarily sitting in a nursing home, that sounds very stereotypical, but you know, if you're sitting there going, you know, Oh, well, I don't want my records. Well, they can't go through and work out who is alive and who isn't. Um, I, it always amazes me that we've got the 1939 register, which is just amazing <laughs> when tracing downward, like we do so much, it is an absolute godsend. It is so, so good because it gives birth dates, it gives all sorts. Um, but I've met people that can see themselves on the 1939 register and you're not supposed to be able to. Okay. So they have gone through and blanked out, you know, redacted um, the, the people that you shouldn't be able to see for the fact that they know they're still alive or whatever, but don't quite know how you can do that in a thorough manner because if they if you can't find them anywhere does that mean they're dead does yeah. that mean they've emigrated somewhere that's a heck of a lot of research so I think there's a lot of presumption shall we say behind some of those blanks and prob probably some presumptions on the not blanks as well so yeah, yeah it's a difficult one I'm very yeah. grateful I wouldn't change it for the world though <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so so you did, but you did census every tenth year except for uh, 1941. Uh, yes, and yeah. the 1939 register was taken um, f at the outbreak of the Second World War. So I understand it was more for kind of rationing purposes and also for getting people to sign up and serve in the forces, uh, and, and just keeping an eye on what, you know, where people were. Um, at that particular point in time, but it was also then subsequently used by the NHS for medical purposes. Okay. So it's wonderful because my grandma um, in 1939, she's long since left us, unfortunately, but in 1939, she was Queenie Mae Jackson. She was born as Queenie Mae Evans. So there's no record of Evans because she's already married, but she's on there as Queenie Mae uh, Jackson. Then it's written over the top. So they cross it out and changed her surname today because she married my granddad because her first husband died in the war. So then it's got her married name written over the top. Well, again, I mean, marvellous for a genealogist because if yeah. you've got people with common names and you can't work out which one's which, which marriage goes to which person, we'll just look on the 1939, it's awesome. And then she decided to change her name to Jane. Because you do that when you're called Queenie May Day, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it's crossed out again. So they've managed to keep a track of her the whole way through her name changes. I mean, I knew all of that, but people in the future won't know that. They yeah. won't have all the documents I've got. And the 1939 gives you all of it. And there's a date next to it when the marriage took place or when the, the record was changed. It might not necessarily be the actual date. And little, little letters that sometimes help to find out where that event took place as well. So it's brilliant. I absolutely love it. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice, nice help. <laughs> Yeah, well, in the absence of a 41 census, of course, mm. it kind of, it, you know, although it's not in the right year, it doesn't really matter. It gives us something. Yeah, exactly. So if anyone has any more questions, please just write them in the comments. <laughs> it's nice to, to hear from you and where you are at. I like Anna's, I would like to have a British ancestor. Yeah. Actually, I would like to have a Swedish one. Yeah. <laughs> what? Or anywhere on the yeah. I tell you what, Anna, I'll swap you one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it really genuinely is. It's something that I, I'm absolutely amazed that however far back I go or however wide I go, there's just none. There is nobody 
that comes in from outside of uh, England. I don't think I've even got any Scot. No, I don't think I've got any Scottish either. Possibly not even Welsh. God, now I'm thinking. I don't think I've got any Welsh either. I think they're literally English through and through. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't think I've um, even got any Welsh. That, that can't be really common either, right? Don't think so. I'm just a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and of course she can borrow what some of hers. Yeah, I'll take one. I'll, I'll take one. Just stop it in anywhere. <laughs> no, it's nice to have Swedish cousins, though. Um, I wish I've actually I've caught up with my cousins. Uh, I mentioned to my mum and dad when lockdown in England first started, which was the twenty third of March for us. And I said to my mum and dad because I talk to mum and dad. I'm an only child, so I talk to my mum and dad pretty much every day. And I said, oh, it would be lovely to see the family and like, you know, try to get all of us together. Why don't we try and do a Zoom meeting? So the first one was, well, it wasn't a disaster. I wouldn't quite say it, that was that bad, but it wasn't exactly easy to get everyone not talking at the same time. <laughs> it was like trying to herd cats, <laughs> but it was absolutely lovely. And my cousin, Jeremy, who lives in Stockholm, uh, I haven't seen him. We think I was probably about five. Okay. Now, without, without giving too much away, that was a long, a long way north of 30 years ago. <laughs> so it's been lovely to catch up with him um, more regularly because we actually have our family gatherings now every two weeks, same time on Zoom every two weeks. Not everyone's been there at all of them. Well, my mum and dad and me have. Yeah. But, you know, we've got one cousin down in Australia. Um, we've got, well, there's, there's seven first cousins, so me and six others. Um, there's my mum and dad, um, two of the widows, because unfortunately my mum's lost all of her siblings. Um, so two of the um, so two of the widows or widowers. Um, and then the next generation down, there's, let me see, I count, one, two, three, four, five six seven that have been online with us on zoom as well so that's been really lovely because lucy's down in australia um jeremy's in sweden his wife and his son are in sweden too so it's been just delightful like doing this with you linda you know yeah, otherwise yeah. we wouldn't, we wouldn't be catching up um so regularly and i've been doing that with quite a lot of friends just kind of getting back from work and okay i'm still sat on my bum at a computer <laughs> yeah but it's really nice just to talk to people and still kind of you know keep keep engaged with people because as I said you know we would have had the show yeah this weekend so this would probably have been the busiest part of my year I'm kind of grateful it's not yeah. <laughs> in a way yeah. in a way but uh but yeah so it's nice to kind of keep those um keep those communications going um I I've just seen a question there I've, I, yeah. about a DNA test yeah I haven't done, I haven't actually done a DNA test and I have had one in my drawer at work for a year and a half <laughs> which is ridiculous because I'm really good friends with um, the guys at Living DNA, which is a company here in here in England. Yeah. Um, I bought a kit from them about 18 months ago. Never done it. It's in my drawer. <laughs> it's crazy. Like I don't know. There's no reason why I haven't done it. It's just there. Yeah. So I have to have to write that on my to-do list. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Remember to do your DNA test. Yeah. <laughs> so we should have some Swedes related to you. <laughs> It'd be interesting, actually, because I. Mm, I <laughs> Oh, they're clearly going to have come from somewhere other than England years back. Um, but it's whether the records go back that far, and the answer is probably no. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, they definitely should do it. But I say yeah. no reason why not because I've got one in the drawer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or perhaps some some of your relatives emigrated and started families somewhere else. So and they have tested. Possibly, possibly. Yeah. Yes, so, I, yeah. I I will do it, as Elizabeth. Says. <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> I wrote it. I've got my little notepad here. I'm going to write yeah. it on. See you later. <laughs> Problem is for me is when you work in genealogy, you don't do your own. No, exactly. No, I, yep. I, the two things I said was I was leaving leaving teaching to do more of my own genealogy and write a book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm, hate, I'm gra grateful no one actually wrote that anywhere and made me sign. I promise I will because I've done neither. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just one of those things because when you do everyone else's, you spend more time doing other people's yeah. than you do yeah. doing your own. Yeah, so, yeah, but it's fun to be able to do it full time. I love it. <laughs> Wouldn't change it for the world. No. So I'm going to ask you also uh, since I'm. Before I started this, I was working with IT a lot for like okay. 
many years, so I'm into tech a lot, and I want to ask you what is your favorite app or program, or um, um, yeah, your favorite app or program where you keep your, how do you keep your um, genealogy organized? Do you have a special um, app for that, or? Do you want an honest answer or a porky pie? <laughs> Um, I, my committee on the Surname Society take the mickey out of me a lot because all of my silicon trees, my, my surname study trees, are in Word because I started so long ago that, you know, back when I first started doing lineages and putting trees together, there wasn't really that much in terms of software. So I just typed it into Word and tab spaced it across and numbered it and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Worked for me and I've never had time to then put it into a program. But at work, we use Family Tree Maker, Family Historian. Um, I'm not a massive legacy fan, not a huge fan of that. Um, I do use it for certain projects because I've got one particular guy that I work for who wants it in legacy. So I kind of have no choice, <laughs> so that or nothing. Um, but no, I'm, it, it, I think if I, had a, if I had to pick, I'd definitely go Family Historian. And when I retire, <laughs> And sort out all of my own genealogy. She says, going, what would I do with the business? Probably just die at my desk. Anyway, um, <laughs> but no, when I get time to do my own stuff, I will probably put it all into family historian. Yeah, um, because yeah, because when I, I guess when you do this research, you have to to keep a lot of uh, people and and build a lot of trees. So yeah, and if yeah. we've got big trees, um, when we've got air tracing work, we will often put it start putting it straight into into um, either family historian or family tree maker. Uh, with a smaller one, again, most of our reports are in Word. So if we've got subcontractors that are doing work for us, they'll just put it in a Word document because uh, it's the easiest way of showing it. It's quite quick to put together. So you can kind of have a, a split screen and just type or slip, snip something and pull it across and um, whatever. So, so we tend to do general easy reports in, in Word still at work. But yeah, if it's a bigger one, I mean, we have some trees that are just, <laughs> The yeah, wallpaper yeah. the wall. Yeah. <laughs> I think the largest one we've had so far is 86 beneficiaries on one case. Okay. Yeah, that was a challenge, especially yeah. the paperwork when it came to the end of getting it all out of the door. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, that 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 is it's uh, the easy part is the re research really, and then the hard part yeah. is writing the report, writing and, uh, it all, putting up, it, yeah. putting it together, and uh, exactly, and yeah. paying 86 different people yeah that is so painful on the bank like yeah not fun that's not my favorite day but part of the job <laughs> yeah and you will also uh, pass on a question for the next week's guest yes i can certainly do that yeah <laughs> um so i, I had a, i had lots of thoughts actually but the one i'm going to go for i've written it down because i knew i would probably otherwise forget so I've got, what interesting mysteries have you solved in your family genealogy or genetic research? So something that was a complete mystery or brick wall or something that you, for ages, were just kind of going, knock, 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 I really want to break this wall down or, you know, fix a mystery in the family or, or in some research you've done for a client. Um, what interesting mysteries can you share with us that you've managed to solve? Great question. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, then... When we are out on uh, like doing speeches and uh, talking to people, they kind of know a lot, of, a lot about us as a genealogist, but could you share something that most people don't know about you? Oh, that was a question. Uh, it's probably something, something I, it's, what, it's the one thing I kind of always think of when it's a weird thing that you'd think, why on earth? Well, two things actually, can I share two? Sure, Is sure, absolutely. Right? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, so number one, I've been down the Calgary bobsleigh run that was featured in Cool Runnings in a bobsleigh. Okay. Which was really cool. They, they have it open and I think they do in lots of the old Olympic parks. So you can pay to go down um, with you know other people that are either other tourists or friends or whatever. So I went to Calgary in 2000 um, just after I graduated, showing my age there. Um, and, uh, and I decided, why not just go down the bobsleigh run? Um, so I've got a certificate. So I've even got like a time of how long it took us to get down the uh, the bobsleigh run, which was pretty cool, actually. Um, I don't think I'd do it now. But when I was in my 20s, it seemed like a really good idea. Yeah. Because <laughs> you literally just get pushed off the top. 
there's no driver there's no brake man there's nothing yeah. you just go yeah <laughs> You do get and you, and, you, and you can't stop it either. It's just, no, yeah. no. <laughs> but uh, they do have the kind of, I think they probably have it. Well, the, the main runs, I suppose they can, but when you go up, you just go. So, oh, yeah, as I say, I probably wouldn't do it now, but when I was in my 20s, it was really cool. Um, literally cool running. Um, and the other thing probably very few people know about me, unless they know me very, very, very well, um, is I play three, sa- I have three saxophones in my spare room. So I grew up playing the saxophone. Um, I've got an alto, a tenor and a baritone saxophone. And uh, before lockdown, I used to play in a local band. I'd started playing again, which was really exciting. And then the lovely virus hit us, so I can't play anymore. Well, yeah. I could play in my spare room. You can but... play solo. Yeah, I can play, yeah. play by myself, but, yeah. but not with other people. So, yeah, it's a shame because we had quite a few gigs over the summer because, of course, it's the time when people you know, have concert bands out in the bandstand somewhere and things like that. So we had quite a few things on, but I think they'll all be cancelled this year. So, yes, lots of, lots of practice to get back up to even where I was in March because I'd only been playing from January to March again. So uh, I was learning to breathe properly again because playing yeah. a baritone sax, it's huge. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was sort of trying to sort out my breathing a little bit more rather than doing two bars and then breathing, two bars and then breathing. <laughs> yeah, I haven't quite got the old, uh, you know, lungs I used to have when I was in my 20s and younger. So, but I've enjoyed, I enjoy, really enjoyed going back to it actually. And it, it was just, just such a shame that it stopped so quickly. But uh, yeah. hopefully, get back to it um, in time when the new normal comes back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really. Really nice, really cool. <laughs> so I guess that's. Um, I think I got all the questions answered that okay. I I had. It's been really really nice talking to you and. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for the uh, invite, Linda. I yeah, yeah. Just subtly came into my Facebook the other day, and I was like, "Oh, that sounds really cool. I'll do yeah. that." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I met you at uh, Rootstek uh, in October last year. Yeah. And uh, we had been f- Facebook friends for a while. And I wild, just went, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I just went up to you and said, hi, you probably don't know me. And you said, yeah, yes, I know I you. <laughs> and I gave you mini me, my little yes, mini me. You <laughs> and did, you did. took around on a little tour for me. <laughs> yeah, I did. And that was so nice because sometimes I go to these uh, events uh, often alone because I don't have any, my, my boyfriend is not into genealogy. Okay. So it's so nice to meet people and uh, like that make you feel welcome and uh, yeah and stuff like that. so uh yeah thank you <laughs> it's all right it's a pleasure that's just me i think yeah. that a lot of people in genealogy are really friendly i mean i actually yeah. put a post on my facebook last night i'd spent last night talking to two of my genealogy friends in the netherlands and then another genealogy friend in canada on monday i'd also spoken to another genealogy friend in canada and i just kind of sat here last night and i thought I'm so lucky to be in this job because yeah. I would never have met those people. I'd never have met you. We'd never have connected if we weren't both working in the field. Yeah. And I think there are just some such lovely people in genealogy that are so willing to help, guide, advise, or just be friends like we are, you know. Yeah. And I think it's just lovely that that is the way that the genealogy community is on yeah. the whole. Yeah, it, it no, really is. No. And yeah, and that, that's why I don't think it's not a problem for me to go like from Sweden to, to London or to uh, anywhere to go to a big genealogy <laughs> event because I know I will always find someone to talk to. And exactly. And uh, Even if someone you didn't know will, them before. Yeah, and someone yeah. will always want to tell what they had found in their. In yeah, their or take own you under their wing and go, oh, hi, Linda, yeah. do you want to yeah. come to dinner tonight or yeah. whatever? Yeah. 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 So it's really, really nice. So uh, yeah. Thank you for being here today and thank no you problem, for pleasure. everyone who has been watching. And I will start the end scene. So let's see where it is there. So have a nice day wherever thank you are. <laughs> Bye. 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 Sitt flor hon när tankarnas vän Vad gör det att solen går neder Då den kommer